then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Let me see. The testing of Jesus. The testing of As we've been learning about this particular section of scripture and looking at it, um, we know that when the Bible in this particular context talks about um, Jesus being tempted by the devil, we know that in truth, the word translated tempt here actually um, is the word that means test. Test. And that's important because the reality is, is that you can't um, you can't tempt God. God is not tempted. And neither does he tempt men. But um, God does um, allow testing. In fact, God himself allows us to test him in the specific area of our, our giving, our sacrifices, our tithing, our offering. And in Malachi chapter 3, around verse 9, God speaks and says to him, bring all the tithes into the storehouse. And then he says, and prove me in this. Prove me. The word prove there in the Hebrew is the word for test. And so there are moments in the life of a believer when God invites us to test him. So the idea of Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, is actually um, God, or rather Jesus, being tested by the devil. Now having said that this morning, what I also want to do is I want to help us kind of grasp um, the um, point of our, of our time together on, on today in particular. Um, Christ, in this particular story, comes into um, this situation and he doesn't uh, stop being God. He's still God. Uh, but you need to know that he is also man. He's not just divine. He's also human. It is the, it is the unique uh, blending for the first time of that which is absolutely God with that which is absolutely man, fused together for the first time in human history. And the purpose of that coming together, the purpose of that union is for the, is for, is for the good of every human being that has ever lived, both Old and New Testament, both them and us, benefit from this unique moment in time when God became a man. Now, in his humanity, Jesus functions on earth just like you and I. Goes through the exact same stuff that you and I experience every day. And later on, that's going to be very important for us because as he um, dies and is raised from the dead and returns to his father in heaven. He becomes our high priest, meaning that he talks to God on our behalf. Whenever you feel like you can't get a prayer through, don't sweat that because you have someone in heaven already talking to God 
on your behalf. And that person is Jesus. And what makes him qualified to talk on your behalf and mine is the fact that he walked on planet Earth as a man and experienced everything that you and I have experienced. The only difference is that he never sinned. If he did, had he sinned, the only sin he would have been able to pay for would be his own. But thanks be to God, because he lived a life separate from sin in terms of personal activity. There's no sin that can be laid on him at all. Because of that, he's able to talk to God right now on your behalf and mine because he's been a faithful son and he's now a faithful high priest. My God, a faithful high priest. Now, he comes into the world wrapped up in human flesh. And because he's in the world, he has to interact with the devil. Satan is waiting for him in the wilderness. Satan has been given the freedom to approach the Lord Jesus Christ and test the record the resistance and the resources the record as I shared with you before the reason why Matthew and Mark and, and Luke are able to share this story in their gospels is because Jesus himself was the one who told the story. In the wilderness, he's by himself. There is no other human being present. But we are told in Mark's gospel that there are wild beasts that are waiting in the wilderness. We're told in Matthew, Mark, and Luke that Satan is waiting in the wilderness. And we're also told that he goes into the wilderness for 40 days, 40 nights. He is there in this place called the wilderness. It's interesting because in another place, another translation is called the desert. Jesus, the Christ, the son of the living God, the heir of God, the lamb of God. He who has lived with God the Father for all eternity in the splendor of heaven, in the presence of Michael and Gabriel, in the presence of cherubim and seraphim, Minions and mights and thrones and principalities and powers who have had angels at his beck and call at any moment. Jesus lands in the desert. He's in a place where only beasts, animals can survive. Human beings do not live in this desert. But Jesus finds himself inside of the desert. Now, when he arrives, the text of the scripture tells us that he's there during this 40-year period, and the whole while he's present, Satan is testing him day in 
and day out. What Jesus does is interesting because the text also tells us that for those 40 days, he fasts, meaning that he eats nothing during that whole period. Probably found water somewhere and did something. The wild beasts were there. They lived there, so probably water available somewhere. But for the 40 days that he's there, he eats absolutely nothing. And when we come to the story, as it is presented in our gospel records, these three temptations that Satan lays before Jesus, these, these testing tools, if you will, that Satan lays before Jesus, these things that he lays out are actually and literally his last attempt to bring the Son of God down. Look at what he says to the Son of God. He says, verse 3, If you be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. That's awful to a hungry man. Watch this. Verse 5. Then the devil takes him up. Matthew 4, verse 5. Then the devil takes him up into the holy city and sets him on a pinnacle of the temple and says to him, If you be the Son of God, cast yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time you dash your foot against the stone. <coughs> Satan quotes the scripture. And he quotes the scripture because he knows the scripture. Please, please, beloved, I know the devil would love to have you sleep today, but you don't want to do that this morning. <laughs> Listen to me. Watch. Verse 8. Again the devil takes him up into an exceeding high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and says to him, All these things will I give thee if you will fall down and worship. Because at the heart of Satan's testing, what he literally wants to do is cause us to worship him instead of God. That's his heart's desire. Amen. He Amen. wants us to worship him rather than God. Now what's all this? What's all this? What's all this? What was all this about? The reason why the translators say temptation is because historical dynamic behind it. And translating it from the original language, the reason why is because the truth of the matter is all three things that Satan offers to Jesus, he wants. He's hungry. Uh -huh. So he wants bread. Something to eat. Listen, he is in fact the heir of God, the heir, the heir of God and and, and he is, in fact, the ruler of all things. And so when Satan says to him, step off this pinnacle of the temple and the angel will come and get you, what that will do is let the people who see it, let them know, identify that their Messiah is present. He wants the people to recognize that the Messiah is present. Wait a minute. But then, here it is. Satan offers him all the nations of the world bowing down to him and, giving, and Jesus wants the nations to recognize and bow down and he wants that to happen. So that in each one of these particular offerings that Satan levels before our Savior, each one Jesus really wants. Hold it. Because there's another thing. The truth of the matter is is that in at least two cases, what Satan offers, Jesus is capable of commanding himself. For instance, 
he says to him, turn the stones of bread. Look, he knows who he's talking to. If he wants to, he can turn the stones to bread. He has the power to do it. Hold it. And if he does decide to leap off of a building, he can command the angels to undergird him and catch him and bring him. He can do that if he wants to. Amen. So that here we have Jesus Christ capable of doing these wonderful and miraculous things. And the truth of the matter is, in each one of these cases, there are some things that Christ desires and wants for himself. What's the issue? Satan is working overtime to get Jesus to act independent of God. He wants Jesus to step out and function independently of his God. It is as if Satan is saying, God knows you're hungry, yes, sir. and he hasn't given you bread. God knows that you want people to recognize you and acknowledge you, and it hasn't happened. Go ahead and get it done yourself. Come on, y'all. Listen, God already knows that you desired that the nations would bow down to you. Listen, they, they, it hasn't happened. He hasn't done it. So you might as well go and do something to get it done yourself. Yes, sir. In other words, shift your allegiance just a little bit. Exercise your own power just a little bit. In other words, everything that God has promised he would do for you, he hasn't done yet. Therefore, it's up to you to get it done. Mm. The trick, the deceitfulness uh -huh. of sin mm. is to bring us to the place where we begin to meet our own needs independent of the promise of our God. Uh -huh. And usually the context for that particular temptation is in light of an extended waiting period. Whenever we have to wait, we are always under pressure. And more often than not, when we have to wait, uh -huh. we get tired of waiting. And then begin to try and figure out ways All right. to fix situations yes. my, my, my. in our lives that God has already promised oh, yeah. he's going to fix. Yes, sir. Amen. The tension in waiting is connected to the fact that I have some ability on my own to do some things. And since I do, there's no need to wait but so long. Wait a minute. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with taking care of some things. There's absolutely nothing wrong. The problem is, is when you and I start putting our hands on the stuff that God himself said he's going to fix. And that's the truth. Individually. And it's the truth congregation Amen. because we are the body of Christ Amen. are you there stay with me so he says um, if you are 
It's the language of this thing is, is, is really interesting too. You know, this people, the King James and if uh, one of the translations actually translate the word literally in the word and the word is sense. You know, sense and see so that so there is no that in choice before there ain't, there ain't no question in Satan's mind as to who he is. He knows who he is. See, he was he, he was up in heaven with him at one point. Amen. Yeah, so he knows what so he says, since you are the son of God. And here's the argument. Since you are the son of God, why are you waiting for this? Now that's a question we can ask Jesus, but that's also a question that we can ask ourselves. Because we are the sons of God. <laughs> Come on, y'all. Don't, 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 don't do this to me this morning. We are the sons of God. So listen, so since we are the sons of God, why are we waiting for God? Okay. Come on, come on. Name it, claim it. Blab it, grab it. Come on. Ready? You know, why, why are you waiting if you are a son you son of God, why are you waiting? You've got ability to manage and handle these things yourself. Why are you waiting on the Lord? The resistance. Look at what Jesus does. Jesus hears it. Jesus hears it. Jesus understands exactly what he said and he knows why he said it. Watch this. But what Jesus does is resist the temptation to do what he knows he has power to do. Do you hear me? In other words, here's what he does. He brings his own ability under Control. My, my. All right. He look. This is Jesus we talking about, y'all. This is the same Jesus that sometime after this, he gonna speak to winds and waves and they gonna behave. And sometime after that, he's gonna walk on the sea. And sometime after that, he's gonna raise dead people and cause them to be returned to their family. He has all power. Wait a minute. And with that kind of power, I'm so glad it wasn't me. Because I'd have turned stones to bread, to chicken, to <laughs> macaroni and cheese. I'd have turned I would turn bread to every kind of, I would have had grapes out there, I would have had all kind of fruit, I would have had some cantaloupe, I would have, right, I would have set up a table, amen, and put a little glass goblet or something on it, right there in the wilderness. But what Jesus does, watch this, is bring all of his power and all of his ability under control and refused to yield to the temptation. See, one of the things that gets us in trouble is that we continue to believe that we deserve better. All right, let me, let me go on this side and talk to this one. We think we deserve we deserve better. Uh -huh. And the reality is, is that if every one of us in here got what we deserve, yeah, I'll let that lay right there. Right. I'll, I'll let you preach that to yourself. <laughs> Deserve, we deserve better. 
but none of us uh -huh. are that great. And none of us are that great. Let me see if I can help you. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. And if in fact there is any good that is seen in us as the people of God, it does not originate with us. It comes from our relationship with the living God. Thank you. And he makes us what we could not be on our own. Amen. And so Jesus has this thing, has this thing together. He understands, he understands in, 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 in great wisdom what he does is bring his own power, bring his own ability under control. He subdues himself. That's the definition, biblical definition of meekness. Most people think that meekness is weakness, but the truth is, is that meekness is actually power under control. Amen. Amen. That's a word there. Yeah, yeah. And Amen. I could knock your head off. But what I choose to do is bring my power and ability under control. I watched this, uh, I watched this um, uh, some time ago on the streets, you know. Sometimes the police come and they come into a situation and it's kind of, they can get up and um, Gotta have, whether you, you know, like it or not, you, you have to have some level of respect for the men and women who serve as police officers. Because um, while there are some who go absolutely insane on the job and do crazy stuff, there are there are there are there are others that we don't talk about or hear about often enough on, on in the media uh, that actually function in ways that will blow your mind because I've watched the situation where people get hostile and get crazy and jump up when they should have sat down and curse and spit and kick and I've watched them bring their authority and their power <coughs> under control because some police officers know how to read the situation and they read it so well they know that this individual is not as violent as they appear to be right. and can be subdued in the right situation. That's right. And so what they do, rather than pull their gun and shoot the person, they bring their power and authority under control uh -huh. and wait until all of the stuff has been exhausted and then they take action. Uh -huh. We have to respect them. And in the light of this moment in the wilderness, I see Jesus doing the same thing, and that is, Devil, I could right now assign you to the lake of fire just by speaking the word. In fact, Michael right now is waiting. Okay, I'm gonna close my Bible. If I told Michael right now what to do, if if Michael had the inkling that I really don't want to be here. I could actually loose Michael alone on you and he'd throw you in a pit in chains right now. But rather than do that now, oh, incidentally, that's coming, devil. That's coming. It's coming. Uh, the, 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 you know, just because it hasn't happened yet, don't mean it's not going to happen. It's coming. It's coming. But I need you to understand that right now, I'm here for a different purpose. Let me bring all of my ability under control. Bring my powers under control. Subdue my own strength and bring it down. And resist you in the name of my Father. So he resists. But then what are resources? What are these resources? And I'm going to go. I'm, I'm going to go. I'm going to go. How do you resist an enemy you can't see with your natural eye? Jesus offers a couple of things. We already laid out one, fasting. 
He's been fasting for 40 days. But then there's something else here. And that is, Jesus recognizes that he did not walk into the wilderness on his own. He was led into the wilderness by the Spirit. And then Mark says that he was led in the wilderness by the Spirit. So the Spirit not only brought him into the wilderness, but the Spirit stayed with him while he was there. Are you there? Meaning that what Jesus understands is, is that while I don't have what I want right now, I'm okay with what I do have. Yes. Hey. Oh, yeah. Come on now. I don't have what I want. Come on now. But I got something else. Right. And what I have is good enough oh, yeah. to get me through this moment. Jesus. And what I have is the presence of the living God. Come on, Lord. Beloved. Here it is, here. Here it is. In the moments when you don't have what you want, yes, sir. rest in what you have. Yeah. Thank you! Yeah. Why isn't God uh -huh. himself yes, sir. enough? Uh -huh. ah. Why is it he enough? Thank you. Beloved, let me tell you something. You have got to learn, I had to learn this lesson. Uh -huh. And that is that there are some things the Lord will give you. Yes, sir. But then there's some things the Lord holds back. Yeah. Something he plans to give you, uh -huh. but he doesn't give it to you in a hurry. And the reason he doesn't give it to you in a hurry is because God wants to teach you and I the lesson of contentment. Yeah. And here it is. Watch this. The lesson of contentment says this. I want that, but I have this. I'm going to rejoice in what I have. Thank you. Watch it. No, no, wait, wait, wait. Here, here it is. Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. I don't have that. But I do have him. Amen. Amen. So there's some things that God withholds because what he does not want us to do is to build a more intimate relationship with the stuff he provides than we do with him. So you and I have the tendency to get tied to and connected and close to the provisions of God uh -huh. rather than the provider. Right. You preach it up in here. So that the blessing yes, becomes sir. more important than the blesser. Yes, sir. And when God understands that, what he does uh -huh. is he puts some things on the shelf. Yes, sir. Your name is on it. But he refuses yes, to let it go uh -huh. because he knows oh, yeah. if we let it go uh -huh. when we want it, we're going to have a deeper relationship right. with the blessing than we will with the blesser. Oh, yeah. oh wait a minute. And God refuses uh -huh. to have competition. Yeah. 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 Hallelujah. You are preaching up in here. God. Yes, sir. You won't have Amen. any uh -huh. competition. Wow. Listen to me. He don't have a problem with you and I having anything. Uh -huh. right. He's right. able to give us everything we heart, our hearts desire. Yes, sir. And the truth of the matter is, is that there are some things he wants to provide. That's right. But the God of heaven is careful about his provision yeah, yeah. because he doesn't want any of us to mess up and start Jesus. thinking that our lives revolve around right. what God can give. Yeah, that's and a word. Man. After a while, after a while, beloved, the relationship becomes one when God is like you're like God's pimp, and you know what that makes him. And, and, and every time you turn around, you want something else. Oh. And then you start having a, ja a Janet Jackson kind of Christianity. Uh. What have you done? Preacher, preacher. I'm 
sit down in three minutes. I'm telling you. Y'all clapped and said y'all were happy that y'all was stuck with me this morning. Now you're acting like you wish somebody else was here. My Lord. What have you done for me? Wait. My brother has already stated that our God is a jealous God. He refuses to have That's right. competition. So here's what Jesus says. Jesus says, as desperately, as bad, as much as I want this stuff, I refuse to lay hold of it. I refuse to turn loose my power. I refuse to do it. Why? Because while I don't have that, God the Father, God the Spirit, right here with me in this moment, and they are enough. Yes, sir. One more thing. Resources. Uh -huh. He fasted. He had the presence of the Spirit of God. But then third, he had the Word of God. All right. Thank you. What Jesus teaches us in this moment is that none of us are equipped to handle the devil without a knowledge of the Bible. All right. Amen. Oh, Amen. If you don't know Amen. the word of God, you will never be able to handle the activity of Satan yes, in your life. Come on down. Satan is so aware of that particular truth that he works overtime to keep you and I away from the word of God. Amen. It's crazy. Absolutely insane that you would try to stand against the hand of the devil without the only equipment that can work against it. Right. Listen, it's look, here what he said. Paul said, Paul said this. He says, finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And then right after saying that, he says, put on the whole armor of God. And while you're doing all of that, he then said, don't forget the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Look at Jesus in the wilderness. Listen to this. With the Word oh, yeah. and the Spirit. Yes, sir. And putting the two together, able to level a powerful blow against the enemy. Yes, sir. You can't win this war without the Bible. Yes, Thank you. There's no way in the world that you're going to defeat an enemy you cannot see unless you have some supernatural power. And you don't have that power in and of yourself. The uh, only way you win right. is understanding what the book says. Yes. So he says, um, he says, turn these stones to bread. Jesus doesn't even rebuke him. Jesus says this. He says, it is written. I'm sorry. Come on. It, is, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. Goodness. So here the devil comes back. Oh, you're using some scripture, huh? Here's what I would do. Let me join in with you because I know some Bible too. Go on and jump off this pinnacle of the temple because he has already given charge uh, get to the angels to watch over you and they're going to make sure you don't dash your foot against against the rock. And Jesus said, yeah, but it's also written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord. Come on, y'all. Listen, let me say, hold on, wait a minute. If you just bow down here and do this thing right, I'll give you all of this stuff if you just bow down to me. And Jesus said, it is written again. Come on, y'all. That thou shalt worship the Lord, thy God, and Him only. Amen. Ah, so, so. Are you seeing what's happening? Yes, yes. Do you see Him using the Bible strategically? Wait a minute. He didn't pull out whole chapters and whole book. Didn't even identify, you know, the verse and the number and all. He didn't go through all that. All He did was say, "It is." Right. Right. Now I'm not talking. 
talking to you and telling you you ought to know as much Bible as Jesus did. But here's what I am telling you. You can use it just like Jesus did. Jesus!
from doing what the Lord has assigned you to do. I wish I had three of you in here that understood what to do. Thank you. 